Good morning. Good morning, guys. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Any questions before we formally start? So, so far so good. Okay, uh, in today's lab, uh, Tutor will talk about uh, uh, homework two and the project related topic, right? So uh, please attend the lab, which is very important. Yeah, so uh, actually, uh, yesterday, at the end of the lecture, we talk about the uh, device driver. I think uh, we also have uh, some very good question to ask about uh, device driver, then we have a, a layer, right? We talk about those layers and so on. Yes, let me turn off this computer, yeah, my desktop com computer. So um, basically, I want to strongly recommend uh, this book, Linux Device Driver. Uh, later, I will, I, I will provide the link uh, to put this into our reference book. Uh, so uh, if you want to know more about uh, device driver, then you can go here. Uh, so basically this uh, tell you how to design a device driver, how to put this into the kernel, and how to interact with um, um, other component inside kernel. Okay. Then we also handle character device, uh, block device, and uh, network device, and so on. Okay, so a uh, very good book. Um, also free open source, okay. So I guess we can start now, okay. Um, so let's continue to talk about IO devices. So first thing, can you guys see the slides, IO devices here? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so yesterday, we mainly talk about uh, the interface, right? So first we talk about uh, structure, then uh, we talk about the interface. Um, basically, for IO device, um, it provide uh, this kind of interface. So, uh, Stat status register, command register, data register. So uh, when we want to act, interact with uh, IO device, uh, mainly through the instruction uh, from the CPU, but we want to interact with uh, IO device, we can go check the status, we can send the command, we can uh, pass through the data or we can read the data from the IO device. Okay. So we also talk about two mechanics to interact with IO device. The first approach is pooling. Basically, we check the after we issue IO commands, we uh, use a loop, for example, this is a typical one, use a loop to 
to check the status about this particular IO operation. Then if this uh, IO operation has been finished, then we can uh, do something else. So this is a typical pooling approach. So uh, this figure show that if we use pooling, then CPU need to wait, uh, busy wait, uh, until IO device either is ready or um, a particular operation has been finished. Okay, so during this time period, also CPU um, is occupied. However, we didn't do any real stuff because we just uh, check the status, busy with. A better approach uh, is interrupt. Uh, then the idea is very simple. When we uh, issue IO commands, if IO operation takes very long time, then we can switch to another task over here, right? Should uh, illustrate in this figure, then when we have a disk IO, uh, after we set up those command and transfer data, then basically we can switch to uh, task two. Then in this way, disk IO and CPU can be working in parallel. Um, which one is better we talk about, right? Basically, if uh, IO operation is uh, very fast, then pooling is better. Otherwise, uh, uh, interrupt is better. Uh, the reason here is that when we do uh, interrupt based IO, basically, we need to switch the context. context. So later we'll talk about process context then you can see that we need to save a lot of registers. So it's uh, very expensive. If IO operation can be finished very fast, then maybe it's not good, okay? So uh, another issue is that maybe we need to transfer data between memory and IO device. Then uh, data transfer itself may take a very long time. So we introduce uh, DMA. Okay. DMA is a hardware. Then after we set up the source and the destination and the size of data, then DMA can help us to do transfer. So in this way, we can um, make CPU free from data transfer. So CPU can be utilized to uh, execute the other process. Uh, illustrated from this figure, you can see that now CPU, after we set up those uh, IO commands, uh, that tells DMAC, I want to transfer data uh, to which device and uh, what is the size and address then we can switch to another process. Then DMA can help us to transfer data uh, between memory and IO device, okay? So we also talk about uh, 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 how to, after we introduce inter interface, we talk about how to find those uh, uh, registers. One way is we can use IO instruction Another way is use memory instruction. Uh, then uh, basically this tell us how to access those uh, interface. In the beginning, we talk about interface, right? So we have status interface, command interface, com uh, status, status register, command register, data register. Then uh, we need to provide a way for CPU to access those uh, IO registers, okay? so. Basically, we have two ways. One way is we can use IO instruction, which means we have a specific instruction for IO operation. Or we can use memory 
mapped I/O, in which we can uh, utilize load and stop to access I/O uh, registers. Okay, so we also talk about which one uh, is better. Basically, uh, I/O injection may be a little bit more efficient. However, it uh, and the complexity in hardware design. So memory mapped I/O now become a um, most popular one. Okay, so um, then we talk about this uh, interface, right? So this uh, uh, abstraction. So basically, when we de design device driver, then um, uh, we have uh, several layers abstraction. Starting from file system, we will provide uh, open read write those uh, prototype then uh, then go to the generic block layer then go to the device driver low level layer then uh, for device driver developer you need to follow those convention to implement those functions okay. so this uh, make um, uh, kernel code uh, more organized and also uh, avoid the bugs Okay. But still, uh, because uh, we have so many different devices, then large portion of the code inside the Linux actually is uh, related to the device driver. Okay. And uh, it include a lot of bugs. Okay. So how to solve those issues actually is one of uh, uh, research topic. People still publish paper, how to solve the device driver Bugging. Okay, so uh, next I'm going to give you an example for IDE device driver. So IDE is uh, our hard disk. Uh, IDE disk is our um, old hard disk uh, uh, device driver. Okay, so basically it can support our IDE hard disk. Then uh, this here, uh, this part actually is just a, a introduction. Okay, so um, basically, just to, want to show you uh, how to utilize uh, those uh, interface to write a device driver. However, different system may have different implementation. This one is based on Linux, and also uh, just a very brief to talk about this part. Okay, so for detail, as I mentioned, go, go back to that Linux device driver book, then um, know more details. Okay, so uh, the architecture here is based on uh, Intel uh, 386. Uh, basically, uh, we have, we use uh, in and out. You can see here, we have in and out uh, IO, instruction, then provide the port number. Port number basically is our address for different device. Okay. Then use this uh, port number then with different uh, value, then we can either transfer our data or set up our uh, buffer, blah, blah, blah. Okay, all different kind of command status uh, data can be implemented through this uh, in and out. In basically, you can think about this read, right? read from the device. Out, basically, we want to write to the device. Particularly, uh, we have some control register related to the interrupt. This one is the most important one. So uh, when we issue read write command, and also check the status. We will go to this address, this IO port address, IO address, one F seven. Okay. Then think about that. When we want to uh, operate hard disk, the most common operation are read and write. We want to read the data from a sector we call. Okay. Uh, we want to. Uh, write the data to a particular sector. So uh, basically we need to set up the address, okay? So where, which sector we want to write to, 
and uh, how many sectors we need to read. Okay, so then we issue the command, that's it. So uh, as we mentioned before, for IO device, we also have stator register that help us to check uh, the uh, device status. For example, is this device busy? Is this ready? Uh, do we have fault and so on? Okay. Then uh, if we have error, then you can check the error uh, register. You, you can see all different kind of uh, uh, error. Okay, from those uh, error registers. So um, simple process is like this, okay? So first we read the status register, as I mentioned, one F7, which is uh, our command register and also status register. So we read this one to wait until our driver is, is uh, ready to be used, okay? Then uh, basically we need to set up how many sectors we want to read, uh, address, okay. Then uh, send the send, then uh, uh, given because here actually this is a parameter. We need to set up parameter to our command register. Uh, basically, which uh, which. Um, a device, for example, master device, slave device, okay, and uh, address, and how many, okay, then to set up the corresponding uh, registers from 1F2 to 1F6, okay, as uh, we mentioned here, you can see that here we have a set of registers to help us to do uh, those things, okay, sector, address, and so on. Okay, then after that, we start the IO operations by issue read and write command to 1F7, okay, this IO address, IO port, okay. Then we do the data transfer now, okay. So wait until this uh, drive status is ready or uh, uh, we have DRQ, right? This uh, driver request for data uh, to right to the data port, okay? So, uh, as we mentioned, disk actually is very slow. So this will allow uh, interrupt. Uh, so basically we can, usually we, after we uh, set up those commands, we will go to the sleep, okay? To uh, release, to yield the control. Then CPU will do scheduling, schedule another process to run. Then uh, after our disk finish, then we will issue, our disk will issue a hardware interrupt. Say, oh, the data transfer has been finished. Okay, then our device driver need to handle this uh, uh, interrupt. Okay, then basically we'll say, oh, uh, who is waiting for? for this uh, IO operation to be finished. Then we have to wake up that the process. Then usually we also process more IO requests. Okay. Then certainly if error occurs, then we need to handle those errors, okay? Then, uh, we, then under this situation, we need to read the status register, then look at the uh, error uh, registers to check the detail reason. So generally speaking, that's uh, the uh, simple uh, device drivers implementation, the all functionality we need to implement for device driver. So uh, then we go to just to show some uh, simple stuff. Uh, basically, you can see first part is here. Actually, we want to do a busy wait to wait until the device is uh, available. This one is used to uh, start the IO request, okay? Then after, see, we call this, uh, we call this function, wait, the device is ready. Then uh, uh, generate interrupt, 
then uh, basically uh, set up those uh, registers, okay? Then uh, do corresponding. Either this is a uh, uh, right operation or read operation, okay? So this uh, start request will be part of our either is our read write operation or with our uh, interrupt operation. Okay, then you can see that we have a, a start request here. We have a start request here. Okay, okay. so then uh, particularly this this function is used to handle read write request. Okay, then when we handle read write request, basically we will acquire this uh, log. Then we check. Uh, our queue, okay. Uh, here actually we have an IO queue here, so we look at IO queue, then uh, find the request, uh, then start process this IO request. Use our start request. You can see here, based on this request, okay. Then from this here, then we do real operation. Here we do real operation based on the read or write. We do real operation. Then uh, we will sleep, okay? Basically after we set up those uh, operations, then we will go to sleep, okay? For this process, go to sleep, okay? Then uh, that's it, okay? After uh, finish, let's just release the lock and so on, okay? So here, here is when we wake up from the, um, when, when interrupt occurred, okay, basically this is a handle interrupt, okay. So basically we will find the corresponding, uh, corresponding, corresponding uh, process to waiting for, to waiting for this data, then um, wake up this one, okay, wake up this process, then uh, process, uh, more request, okay, after we uh, interrupt, okay. So I know this is a kind of, a, you know, it's very abstract. Um, actually, I just go through this, uh, uh, simply go through implementation. The detail, I understand it's not clear, uh, but uh, it cannot be clear. So you have to implement a device driver then you understand this part. So uh, if you want to know details, please go to that uh, link to device driver then uh, you 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 can uh, really understand this part. Okay. So uh, basically, that's uh, that's the that that that's all related to the I/O device. I give a very simple introduction. Uh, in fact. Um, this part also is very important. If you want to know more, please go to the textbook to read the concept, then go to the link to device driver, then really uh, design some device driver, then uh, you can really understand this part, okay? So next I'm going to talk about the process. Okay. So any questions at this moment? I will, I will uh, go, go to look at, uh, yeah, what is the log, okay? So I think I got one question, what is log? Okay. So uh, this is a very good question, okay? What is log? Right. So uh, later we'll talk about this. Uh, generally speaking, remember we talked about that concurrency issue, right? So before we talk about uh, uh, use that uh, counter, so we have two thread to count. Then uh, if, uh, um, we have a global variable count over there. Then because when we do this operation, each operation is not uh, atomic, then basically the result is uh, unpredictable. Okay. So uh, it depends on the access sequence. Uh, then whenever we have a shared variable, shared global variable, that will be accessed by multiple Thread. For example, in this case, we have a 
uh, data structure. We have the, the uh, data structure that uh, IOQ. Oh, we have this uh, uh, IDE device. Okay. So basically, we want to create a uh, um, exclusive, mutual exclusive access, which means that when we only we we only allow one process to enter this session to access our shared global variable. Okay, so then how to guarantee it? Basically, we have lock. Okay, we call lock. Okay, lock is kind of like our room lock. Uh, the difference here is that after you get lock. You enter the room, which is our critical session, then you don't allow other people to get into it. Okay. Then after you finish your operation, then you can unlock, release the lock. Then other people who want to utilize this uh, uh, shared variable, then can enter into this uh, critical session. Okay. So basically, that's the lock. Okay. So. We will talk about log later. Uh, not only log, how to use log, actually we also talk about how to design log, okay, later. Okay, so it will be clear later. But generally speaking, we want to avoid um, concurrent access for a global variable if this var a global variable is shared uh, among a lot of different processes. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I know I know this part is a, a little bit quick uh, and also it's not may not be very clear. Uh, but uh, see if you really want to understand this part, please okay, go to the uh, device driver, link to the device driver, that book. Uh, later I will release uh, the link here to you uh, from our uh, blackboard. Okay, so uh, if you guys don't have any other questions, maybe we can continue to talk about um, process. So can you guys see uh, virtualizing CPU process? This slide. Okay, so now let's go to the uh, process part, okay. so. Uh, basically, at this moment, where we are, we finish the we finish the file file system part, persistent part, and the I/O devices and storage. Of course, this is a very uh, brief introduction. But generally speaking, we talk about how to implement a file system, very simple one, some uh, basic function, and also we talk about I/O devices, how I.O. device uh, work interact with CPU, uh, then what is the interface, then we also provide a very, very brief uh, uh, device driver based on the Linux operating system, okay? So now let's go to the um, process and the memory management, okay? So this part is related to the virtualization for uh, our mainly for process, okay? So uh, here, generally speaking, we have two parts, process and CPU scheduling and uh, memory management, okay? So our homework three will be related to the pro uh, CPU scheduling, okay? Here, we have uh, one paper-based homework, and also we have a uh, program-based homework, uh, that one is uh, an, a bonus, basically, okay, five points, okay. So uh, before we go to the process, let's look at our whole operating system architecture. So uh, again, here, user program, 
we talk about user program, right? We introduce system call. Then use system call to trap into the kernel. Okay. Then inside the kernel, kernel actually you can think about is a kind of a system call service provider based on different system call then provide different service. For example, if we want to generate a new process, you call fork, then we will uh, trap into the kernel then from the kernel, inside kernel, then we will create some data structure related to this process and the return, okay? Then inside the kernel, basically we, we divide into two parts, file, file system part, we finish already, okay? And also IO device, this part is our, our IO device, okay? This part is our file system, we finished, okay? So another part is our process control. This is a huge part. Basically, you can think about uh, if you want to run a program, then you have to create a process. Now, how to manage those process inside kernel? This is our process control. Then it involves several issues. For example, how to manage memory? Because when we run a process, we need to load our data and the uh, program into memory. Then if we have multiple running program, they call process, multiple processes running at the same time, then we have an issue how to manage the memory. Then if we have multiple processes running, uh, then we, with limited uh, physical CPU, then we have to decide which one to run. Then what is the mechanism to do the scattering? Okay. Uh, another issue is uh, related to inter-process communication, how to do communication and so on. Okay, so first, let's look at the process from a very uh, high level, uh, abstraction level. Okay, so remember we already talked about process, right? So you may wonder why we talk about process again. Uh, Actually, in the beginning, when we talk about process, we mainly from user level, we introduce system call. Here, we are more inside the kernel. Uh, basically, we want to show you how to design process. Okay, okay so uh, first, first, operating system provides the illusion that many virtual CPU coexist. So from user perspective, actually we have no idea uh, whether or not a running program is running or is uh, waiting. So uh, we just, uh, our illusion is that our program is running right now, right? Okay, then suppose we only have a limited number of CPU. Nowadays maybe we have a more CPU, CPU core, right? Eight core and so on, four cores. But still, when we uh, look at our system, uh, at a particular moment, we may have up to hundreds of processes running. Okay, so certainly uh, it's impossible to have uh, to give each process one physical CPU. So how to solve this problem? The idea is very simple, share, 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 right? Time sharing. So basically uh, we will run one process with uh, one CPU for uh, time period, then stop, then running another uh, process, okay? So generally speaking, uh, we have one resource here, then we have multiple process want to execute it. Then we will divide our time into, suppose it's our time, then we, we will divide into different time slots. Okay, for example, time millisecond, okay? Then we will assign time millisecond to each process, okay? okay. Of course, okay? We need some mechanism to do this, okay? Then we will talk about that CPU scaling, how to do this. 
certainly we want to guarantee the performance and so on. So uh, before we talk about how to share CPU, let's look at what is the process. Uh, I think we already talked about process, but now let's look at from the kernel perspective, what is the process? Process is running program. Then uh, we, we need the memory, as we mentioned, right? We need the memory. So particularly here, we need an address space. Okay, we will talk about this later. Uh, generally speaking, we need uh, our program, which uh, consists of instructions and uh, data, right? So we need program and data in order to run our process. Then our program and the data will be put into memory. So somehow we need to find some physical memory space to hold our instruction and the data, okay? Then, as we mentioned before, when we run a program, we at least need a program counter. So program counter will tell us uh, where to fetch next instruction, right? So program counter. Stack pointer also is very important. Okay. The reason here is that whenever we want to call a function, then we will have a, we will store some, when, when, for example, we, we go to a particular uh, uh, function call. Suppose, okay, sum A and B, okay, then return, return, right, A plus B, okay, this kind of function. So suppose we have main function here, call this uh, sum, right, give uh, one and a two, right. So when we do this kind of uh, operation with this kind of a program, when we call this sum function, actually we will switch to another stack frame for the for this function sum. Okay, particularly here we have some local variable related to. Uh, suppose we have some local variable here, then it will put here and also include our argument. Uh, we call the function. Those arguments will put onto the stack and also return address. After we finish, we return back. Okay return address, okay. Uh, generally speaking, local variable related to a function will be stored into the stack frame. Okay, then in this way, basically, we can run our function call. Okay. So that's, uh, that's why we, this is a very important stack pointer, okay. Uh, you may say, okay, I don't need any function. Okay, I don't need a stack pointer, sorry. Whenever you want to run the program, your main function also is a function, okay? Even you don't call function, actually when we, when we call main, we also, the system need to set up your step pointer. Then put your uh, input argument. For example, in main function, you may have some input argument, then we will put into the stack. Then if you don't set up stack pointer properly, then basically we cannot, the program cannot be run, cannot be executed. So stack pointer is very important. Okay. API, actually we spent a lot of time on process API, right? Create, what is the corresponding system call for create a process? Huh? Hello, guys? Hello, guys? Fog, right? Okay, thank you, guys. Okay, fog, right? Uh, destroy is exit, right? So basically we can exit, okay? Wait is wait, right? Mislinear uh, control, basically this mainly relate to the signal, okay? We didn't talk about signal, but uh, if you are interested, then you can go, go to look at the signal part, okay? Relate to a process, then you can wait for a particular signal, then a system can send your signal, other process can also send those signal to you. Right? Status, right? 
relate to how to check status and so on. So we, we also talk about the PS, right? To check the status, okay, those system call. So this is uh, the API, those system call we provide to the user. Um, but from the kernel perspective, so when, for example, let's uh, particularly look at the fork, okay? When user program called fork, okay, what happened? Okay, so this is a process uh, to relate to create a, a process. The process relate to create a process, okay? Yeah, so that's exactly I'm talking about. We want to create a process, right? This is the whole process related to create a process. Okay? So first step, we need to load a program code our program into the memory, okay? Particularly, we need to load this into the address space of the process. Later, we'll talk about this address space. Then it will be clear for every running program, we already build up an address space. When we compile this uh, program, when we make it become executable program, we already create an address space. Then load, loader. When we load this program to make it become process, actually we will follow this uh, uh, compila compilation address space, then uh, set up, load the program into the corresponding location, okay? Yeah, so uh, program initially is the executable format. For example, one common use is the ELF for format. Executable uh, and the link, link, executable and the link uh, format. Okay, this is widely used the format. Okay, then follow this format, then we will load our program. So, however, when we do this loading process, we will do it very lazy uh, manner. So you may say, what, what, what does that mean? <laughs> so how come we have a, a lazy and a, uh, do we have those uh, uh, diligent? Actually, this is not uh, lazy, that's lazy, okay. So in computer science, we usually have lazy approach and eager approach, okay. Eager, okay, and a lazy approach. Lazy approach means when we allocate the memory, actually we do it on demand in the beginning, when we load this uh, process into memory, actually we only load, uh, uh, maybe it's one page. Okay, later we'll talk about it. It's a very small portion in order to run this process. Okay, then later on demand, if we, later we say, oh, we need this part, okay. Then we will do allocate the physical memory space for this part. So this approach we call lazy. Okay. Another one is eager. Eager means, okay, I'm a very, you know, when we create a process, I, I will create, I will allocate all space okay, for this process. So this is called uh, eager. Okay. So anyway, uh, consider our memory space is um, limit, is constrained. So when we load code or data into the memory, we only do this in an on-demand manner, which means when we need, then we will, uh, during, a pro during program execution, when we really need this part of uh, memory, then we will load this uh, code and data into memory, uh, allocate the physical memory, so basically. Okay, second, relate to the stack. As I mentioned, okay, stack is very important, okay? So we will use stack to, for the function, local variable, then the parameter, when we call this function, those parameter and also return address need to be put into the stack, okay? So for example, for the main function, when we go to the main function, uh, usually we have some, uh, how many uh, parameters, what is each parameter, right? Those things will be put into our stack, okay? So we need to set up our stack properly. Third one, related to the heap. I think we discussed heap a little bit 
So generally speaking, um, uh, heap is used to uh, contain the data dynamically allocate using malloc. Okay, we talk about malloc. So basically, uh, those data will be uh, put into when we call block, those memory will be uh, allocated from the heap. Okay. Then we also need to do some initialization task. For example, uh, set up I/O devices, input output device, uh, particularly uh, that console. Remember, we want to uh, when we create a process, we already have three descriptor zero one two. Uh, all are mapped to our console device, right? Then uh, we have those uh, file descriptor then connect to those uh, I, I node correspondingly. Then later when we do I O, then we can go, go there, okay? After everything set up, then we go to the entry point, that uh, starting point from our main function. Then we call, we, we jump to, use a jump function, jump to that location. How to jump actually is set up our program counter. Okay, set up program counter. Then our program counter will hold the address, which is our starting entry address of our program. Then basically next the class actor will fetch the instruction from starting address. Then we start to uh, executed our newly grid process, okay? I know this is, may not be clear, okay? So, uh, but anyway, okay, I will, I will discuss this uh, next week in more detail. Uh, but generally speaking, we, we, when, we, when we create a process, we have a in-memory image. You can think about it, it's, we call address space. We have some code here, we have some, uh, uh, data, then we have a heap, okay? So go this way, then we have stack. Stack go uh, from the high address, then heap from the lower address go, go down, okay? Then we have a code and the data. Uh, of course, this is static. Those global variable all initialize the data. Uh, static data will be put into our data section that our code is our program. Then other part, maybe we need to malloc some data, malloc some space for dynamic generated data that put into the heap. Then when we call function, then we will stack frame put into our stack, okay? So uh, this is our process image when we create the process, okay? So uh, it's, it may not be clear, I know. I introduced a lot of new terms. Uh, it will be clear later. So when we go through each part, okay. So uh, time is up, okay. So that's all for today's lecture. So uh, I'm going to answer your question. Um, so we will go to the, we'll go to the QA session now. So uh, if you want to continue, you're you are welcome. Then if you have a other important thing, yeah, you can leave now. So let, let me go to the whiteboard then copy those questions. So somehow I didn't get those questions. Yeah, let, let me. Go to here again. So give, give me one second, okay. Copy those fun, copy those uh, questions. How come I could not copy those questions? Yeah, so uh, I guess the one question is, uh, the first question is related to what? Lazy, uh, is lazy very slow? Um, yes, that's a very good question, okay. 
yeah, somehow today I could not copy those questions. How come? Yeah, maybe I copy one by one. So to answer first question, is lazy, is lazy very slow? Of course, lazy is slow, right? So uh, compared to you load the whole program and data into memory, certainly uh, use a lazy manner is slow, right? But uh, say uh, later you will realize, okay, uh, we have a lot of uh, process space actually we don't use. So um, uh, it's okay. Yeah, and also uh, we always have trade off when we run multiple processes. Um, this approach is shows uh, much better okay. um, result. Okay, of course it's lazy, but uh, anyway, that's that's the price we paid, right? Jump and uh, yeah, I, I think I copy one question here. Jump and the stack allocation I done. So when we write C code, the compiler does all heap stack jump function for us. Um, stack related, yes, you are right, okay. Stack operations, um, compiler will help us. When, when, we, when we uh call function, then compiler will generate code to set up the stack for us. Heap, uh, in the beginning, we will set up heap. Heap. We need to use a malloc to, to allocate the memory. Okay. So compiler cannot help us. Okay. I hope I answer your question. Okay. Basically, uh, function call, right? Uh, related stack. Uh, stack frame will be set up by compiler. Um, clip need users, right? Users malloc function, right? To to allocate, right? So that's uh, my answer. So is this uh, clear? So how is a hip? How is the uh? So the next question, okay. So is a trade-off between the performance and the, yes, I think the question related to the uh the lazy part, right? Is a trade-off between the space and the performance? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So when when we use the lazy, actually we treat uh, the space for the performance, okay? We want to save the space, okay. you are right. So how is the heap implemented in the memory? Okay, so we will talk about heap later, but the generally speaking, uh, heap uh, is a part of our virtual memory. Then um, uh, we will map over there, then you can think about uh, uh, it's not very difficult. Uh, so uh, generally speaking, when you call malloc, we will see that oh, the start from here, start start from particular address, we should allocate some uh, uh, physical space. Then that's it. Okay. Then later, if we free, then we, we have to see oh, this uh, this uh, part of uh, physical memory should we return to the system or we keep it? Okay. Then that part is a little bit uh, complicated. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll talk about this later for the heap implementation. Yeah. Yeah, trade off uh, when we write C compiler, jump and uh, down assembly. So, no, no, it's not a jump and stack operations. Uh, so assembly is only a language, right? So basically, after our C program, you write C program, we can also compile 
our C program into the assembly language. Then finally, assembly language will be translated into the machine code. Okay. So it doesn't matter you write into C language or you write into assembly language. In the end, it becomes machine code, right? So it's not the issue really to use assembly to implement or use C implement. Basically, we need to end those instructions, machine instructions related to the stack operation for the function call. Okay. Yeah, I think I answer all questions here. I wonder how Smolok express in the assembly language. Okay. So, yeah, um, <laughs> it's a hard to uh, answer this question. So, basically, your question is related to uh, how to implement block, right? Yeah, so uh, you can think about malloc actually is used to allocate some memory. So generally speaking, we will go to our memory allocation part See, okay, so this is our address space, then starting from uh, which location we should uh, um, allocate some uh, physical space or virtual space. Then basically that's it, okay. Yeah, so uh, in terms of assembly uh, implementation, basically is a kind of, a, we set up some uh, state structure, then see that represent all oh, this, uh, uh, this part of the memory is uh, available, okay? So it uh, depends on the uh, implementation related to how to manage memory. If we use a page, then basically we will see that uh, uh, those pages are mapped into our, uh, those uh, address are valid now, okay? You can use, basically, okay? We will talk about this later, okay? <coughs> so any other questions? I know it may not be clear from a log, but yeah, we, we didn't go, go to that, that part, okay? So I hope this will be clear later. Okay, any other questions? Okay, looks like no more question, okay. So uh, remember uh, today we have a lab, please join the lab, okay, which is very important. Okay, then I will see you next week. Bye-bye.